Today's video is going to be a little bit different because it's pretty rare for us to sort of sit down and talk a little more candidly, but Greg was uh, looking up something the other day we wanted to share. Yeah, I looked up the top 25 science YouTubers. This is based on subscribers. Putting the list together was kind of striking. You have Vsauce, the slow-mo guys, Mark Rober, in a nutshell, the king of random, crazy Russian hacker, crash course, ASAP science. That's, That's us. us, if you can tell from the photo. <laughs> Smarter Every Day, Veritasium, SciShow, Dr. Mike, Minute Physics, Vsauce 2, Backyard Scientist, Vsauce 3, Number File, It's Okay to Be Smart, 3 Blue, 1 Brown, Tom Scott, Real Engineering, Minute Earth, Simone Gertz, and PBS Space Time. There's a lot to talk about here um, when it comes to gender, gender non-binary people. The first woman on the list, solo woman at least, is number 24. There are no black people, there are no indigenous people, there are no people with disabilities. The fact that this list is all white, I was surprised, but I also then wasn't surprised. This is an issue that we want to talk about today in, in the STEM community. And specifically in science and in science communication on YouTube because that's the bubble that we all kind of live and work in and engage with every day. And what we want to talk about today is race in regards to the very significant shift in I think a lot of, especially white people's ability to talk about institutional racism. We want to talk about it with some science today, but also give a tangible goal that we can all do to change the institution of science. If you took science courses, think about the history you learned. Whose faces were represented? Who was even allowed to participate in science? Were women allowed? Were people of color allowed? They did were... queer people exist? They, yeah. did. they did, they did, they just did. But there's that conversation if you think the foundation of science was kind of born out of whiteness and born out of this sort of Eurocentric view of how people live there. Early science and taxonomy led by Carl Linnaeus incorrectly posited that humans fell into four distinct subspecies. Homo sapiens europaeus, the people of Europe who were white, serious, and strong. Homo sapiens asiaticus, the people of Asia who were yellow, melancholy, and greedy. Homo sapiens americanus, the people of America who were red, ill-tempered, and subjugated. And Homo sapiens afer, the people of Africa who were black, impassive, and lazy. And Carl Linnaeus even speculated privately that they might not even be human at all. It was a historic moment when science started to distance itself from religion and hold its own power, and the power was incorrect and racist. The King of France at the time ordered this taxonomy to be adopted as the correct classification system of humans. And as recent as 1921, the American Museum of Natural History held an exhibition on eugenics which falsely claimed that black people's brains were smaller than white people's. Charles Darwin's son attended the event and adopted the idea of racist eugenics, the proliferation of this false science led to the U.S. borders closing to people from Asia, Africa, Southern and Eastern Europe because ill-informed and racist scientists of the time thought people from these countries were mentally defective and biologically undesirable. People really do have a fundamental belief that science isn't biased. We just have to say we disagree with that. Even if the idea of science in and of itself is this pure form, the second you introduce humans into that, you introduce bias. Look at the question, look at the discussion at the end of every study, that's when people start to fling around <laughs> their feelings. The way that we study science and the things that we learn about, if they're led by a homogenous group, we're really only learning about one lens of life. A good scientist takes in information and changes their worldview, so they are adaptable. So I do think that as a science community, we can you know, fight institutionalized racism potentially more easily because we are willing to take in the facts and to make changes based on them. Here are some examples of research on anti-black racism in STEM. Studies have found that white doctors are less likely to prescribe black patients uh, medication for blood clots. They believe racist myths about black people, for example, that they have higher pain tolerance and thicker skin. They themselves don't feel like they're being racist, but within their institutions, they are acting with institutionalized racism. There are even infamous scientific experiments that have used black bodies without their consent for the benefit of science. So the Tuskegee experiment is a famous example where they used around 600 black men with syphilis and told them they were getting treated, but they actually weren't so that they could study what happens when syphilis goes untreated for 40 years. And this was without consent. The most recent uh, Nature magazine, and there's a study 
about how they are conglomerating a bunch of genomic research, fascinating research to understand humans and to understand diseases in humans. And at the end they say there were very few black people, very few South Asian people. That's an example of today, an institution finding breakthroughs in research and very important uh, genomic information to help our health that is ignoring a whole population of people due to a system. There's also a lot of research on research. So minorities are less likely to have their research published. They're less likely to be given um, raises or rewards even when they're at the same level as their white colleagues. There's also something really interesting called the diversity paradox. So they found that minorities are more likely to have innovative ideas. They're bringing in new perspectives for science, but they're less likely to be given academic positions. Studies have shown that white people get 53% more callbacks than minorities. And then even in those callbacks, they started to do studies of, okay, who actually gets the job when they're equally um, equipped or equally qualified for the job. White people end up getting the job 143% more often than minorities. Yes, we can say we just wanna hire the best person and put the most talented person in that position, but I think we just have to acknowledge that we all have biases that are unintentional, that impact what it means to be the best candidate, and if we can't acknowledge that root problem, then we'll never even be able to address sort of the more surface problems. Now we should talk about something that we can do. If we are in the sciences, when we enter rooms, when we enter meetings, if everyone happens to be white, I think that's an important time to talk about anti-racism. I think a lot of work can be done in rooms of white people because we know those meetings are happening, okay? We are in them all the time. A fellow science communicator and friend, Dr. Esther told us, it is not up to marginalized people to be burdened with making systemic change in institutions. I think as creators, we can all be putting in more effort to highlight other voices that are different from ours. How can we as a community, including us, look to people that have different perspectives? Dr. Esther will teach you fascinating stories about marginalized figures in STEM. Jordan Harrod can teach you about how AI preserves systemic racism. Mike Like Science can teach you a rap about coding. Jabrils can show you how AI can draw new Pokemon with math. Jada L. Cock on TikTok is so funny and will teach you about about animal facts and Anna Gifty, another amazing friend on Twitter, will blow your mind and she actually was able to make us even like economics. But we also think we really need to talk about the institutions. So obviously we make a lot of content on YouTube, but also Facebook and Instagram and all these platforms that play a role in this. And I think as viewers and as creators, there are ways that we can influence and impact those groups as well. In 2019, Google's workforce was 54.4% white, 39.8% Asian, 5.7% Latinx, 3.3% Black, and 0.8% Native American. So these stats are for America. 2019, Google's leadership was 66.6% .6 white, 28.9% Asian, 3.3% Latinx, 2.6% Black, 0.7% Native American. And also staggering, Google's workforce is only 31.7% women, and their leadership is only 26.1% women. Assuming gender binaries, they didn't have information about gender non-conforming people. In 2019, Facebook's workforce was 44.2% white, 43% Asian, 5.2% Hispanic, 3.8% Black, 3.1% mixed, and 0.7% other. Looking at leadership, 65.4% were white, 24.9% were Asian, 3.5% Hispanic, 3.1% Black, 2.9% mixed, 0.3% other. This shows you how the higher you go up in all of these institutions, the whiter it gets. So we need to talk not only about hiring diverse people, but also creating better promotion initiatives to get different people to the top. Creating cultures where people of diverse backgrounds actually wanna work at these companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, Silicon Valley startups should have to openly disclose which universities they are recruiting from. In America, how many are they hiring from predominantly white schools like Stanford or MIT compared to HBCUs like Howard or Alabama a and Facebook has currently been accepting paid political advertising on their platform, regardless of if it has false claims or hate speech. They say they do not want to be the arbiter of truth, but their algorithms already control our truth. They decide what we see, what goes viral, and what shows up on your timeline. And 90% of hate speech on Facebook is identified by AI. Who designs this technology is integral to it working. What I am asking for is public information 
about the breakdown of race and gender representation in specific jobs. Because I'm curious who is building these algorithms that are controlling what we all see. It's about arming ourselves with that information to challenge when we're in those meetings, to talk to people in positions of power at Facebook or Instagram or Google. At large, we also see in science when you have more diverse voices, you get different perspectives. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really amazing study. Over 2.5 million papers they looked at and they studied the last names of the paper and they found that the more diverse those last names were, the more likely those journal articles, scientific articles were to be cited. And assuming that citation actually means that the you know journals are more meaningful or valid, that's like a, to me, a really tangible, fascinating study about how diverse perspectives make things better and flourish. Why does it matter at all? Apart from the fact that we're seeing things like expressed in police brutality against black people, I think even as queer people, we know representation matters. There's so many studies that show if you can see yourself in a position. So if you as a queer young person see other queer people in science, it can inspire you. If you're a young black person and see representation of black people as scientists, as science communicators, in programming that represents like learning and education, you're much more likely to be inspired to do that because you see a space for yourself. I would love to hear other people's experiences in the comments because sometimes, I mean, we like to quote a lot of research. There's research that shows that focusing on individual stories actually can change people's minds. It's harder to acknowledge and see systemic racism, but when you have a tangible story, it matters a lot. And so I think it's important for people to share their stories, no matter what your perspective, no matter what makes you unique in this science space. You shouldn't stop watching the people you like. It has nothing to do with that. A lot of people are making amazing content, but maybe just push yourself outside of your comfort zone sometimes. If we can stop and acknowledge our own biases, I think that would be an amazing step forward in just making science an even more amazing field. If this sparked any ideas for you, you can write in the comments below and we will continue to answer those questions. We wanna keep talking about this. The work that we have to do to challenge institutional racism starts now. It's about moving forward. It's not something that we just involved ourselves in for two weeks while the cultural zeitgeist was there. The real work starts now. So yeah, let us know if you want us to make a video about affirmative action, make a video about something else. We would love to do that, to be motivated by you to keep going.